My son died shockingly after marriage. Thirteen days later, I received a mysterious letter from him. Revenge on my wife for me. I read in a letter from my late son, Dorian, who passed away suddenly, leaving behind a once happy marriage. Revenge on my wife for me. Those words were followed by an address I didn't recognize. Is this where Dorian wants me to go? I wondered. My tears had stopped but were now replaced by cold sweats. I never imagined Dorian using a word like revenge. He must have been pushed to his limits. What could I possibly find out there? Since the funeral, I had been cooped up at home, but I immediately rushed out, forgetting even to do my makeup. But right now, that didn't matter. I wanted to honor my beloved son's last wish. Driven by a single purpose, I hurried to the address written in Dorian's letter. The place he directed me to was a rental storage facility a bit away from my home. Among the rows of storage units, I found the one numbered in the letter. Inserting a thin, small key that was attached to the letter into the lock, I opened the door. The small room, about the size of a half-bedroom, was dimly lit and slightly musty despite it being daytime. When I pressed the switch for the fluorescent light next to the door, the exposed bulb buzzed to life, illuminating the room. What is this? I exclaimed, feeling an instinctive fear that made my whole body tremble. My name is Ember James. I'm a 54-year-old part-time employee. It's been 20 years since I lost my beloved husband. He had mentioned feeling a bit unwell, and not long after he passed away. His death was so sudden and unbelievable, I still find it hard to accept. He wasn't suffering from any serious illness and had always been diligent about his annual health checkups. Yet despite this, he left me and our son, Dorian, behind. After my husband's death, Dorian and I lived together at that time. Dorian was just in elementary school and seemed unable to accept his father's sudden passing more than I could. My in-laws also started visiting frequently to take care of Dorian. It seemed as if Dorian was desperately trying to hide the loneliness of not having his father around. Responding to our grief, he even encouraged me when I would frequently panic. Mom, it's okay because I'm here. His young voice still echoes in my ears. After losing my husband, I started working part-time to raise Dorian, trying to forget the sadness amidst the daily busyness. Dorian never complained, even though I was often busy and away from home. He must have felt lonely too, but he never said a word and continued to encourage me. In response to Dorian's support, I gradually overcame my sadness. As time passed in middle and high school, Dorian started working part-time, helping with the household finances. He did this to avoid putting too much strain on me, balancing work and his studies. He was a good student, and at parent-teacher meetings, his teachers would praise him so much that it almost embarrassed me. Despite losing his father, I am grateful every day for how wonderfully he has grown up. After graduating high school, Dorian started working right away. He had the grades to aim for any university, but I think he considered my situation. I'm tired of studying he said, and began working at a small local factory. Dorian, always smart, learned his job quickly and was well-liked at the factory. Despite the challenges of physical labor, his days seemed fulfilling. A few years passed and Dorian found a girlfriend. He used to stay in on his days off, but then he started going out almost every weekend. As a mother, I felt a bit lonely, but I was also relieved that my son at that age had a girlfriend. Above all, Dorian seemed happy, which made me happy. He had always been considerate of me, continually supporting me. Now, I wanted him to think about his happiness. I watched over his relationship from a distance. When Dorian turned 27, he decided to get married. His fiancée was a woman two years his senior named Flora. When they got engaged, Flora came with Dorian to meet me. Compared to the rather reserved Dorian, Flora was a striking beauty with distinct facial features. I was surprised not only that Dorian brought home such a woman, but also that they met at a drinking party. I was taken aback by this unknown side of my son, whom I had doted on, but I had no bad impression of Flora. She worked in sales at a cosmetics company. I learned, perhaps because of her job, that she was good at conversation, and our first meeting ended in a pleasant atmosphere. Soon after, they had their wedding and Dorian moved out to live apart from me. Mom, are you sure you'll be okay alone? It's still in the county, but a bit far. Dorian worried until the very last minute before moving. Flora also seemed concerned about me living alone, and there was even serious talk of us living together for a while. 
Though it was a kind offer, I couldn't impose any further on Dorian. I graciously declined their kind intentions and celebrated their new life together. Even after that, Dorian frequently visited me. But I noticed he was getting thinner. He had chosen to change jobs to be closer to Flora's company, but it seemed to be quite tough for him. Unlike the small factory he was used to, Dorian had chosen a sales job and apparently the stress had caused him to lose his appetite. You've lost weight again, haven't you? It's good to work hard, but it's serious if you ruin your health, you know. I'd express my concern every time Dorian visited home, but he would just say, I'm fine, really, showing no intention of changing jobs. Initially, I assumed his stress was due to the unfamiliar job, but it took me a while to realize that this wasn't the only thing troubling him. I've told him, but he won't listen. Maybe Flora could talk to him. He can be so stubborn, I thought. Three years into Dorian and Flora's marriage, as Dorian turned 30, his complexion worsened and he seemed on the verge of physical exhaustion. I often asked him why not change jobs instead of overworking himself, but he stubbornly refused. Perhaps it was his sense of responsibility from being married to Flora that made Dorian feel he couldn't just quit his job now. Seeing this, I contacted Flora, asking her to encourage Dorian to consider a job change. Flora seemed worried about Dorian getting thinner day by day and tearfully apologized to me, saying it was her fault. Flora, you're not to blame. Dorian has always been a hard worker and tends to push himself too hard, but he might listen more readily to you than to me, I said honestly. I had been feeling somewhat irritated with Flora for not doing anything about Dorian's deteriorating health since their marriage. Despite my repeated requests for her to take care of him, she did nothing but apologize. Yet I couldn't blame her outright, so all I could do was watch as Dorian's health declined. Days passed since I contacted Flora, but there was no sign of any response from her. She must know how worried I am. Wouldn't it be normal to at least get in touch if concerned about Dorian? I found myself getting irritated over small things. I decided to calm myself and took the initiative to contact her. Hi, Flora, have you talked to Dorian since our last conversation? I carefully chose my words as I asked Flora. Then after a moment's pause, an unbelievable response came. No, it wasn't words. It was a click of the tongue on the other end of the phone. Flora clicked her tongue. Mother-in-law, I'm busy with my work too. I'm keeping a close eye on Dorian's health. Aren't you being a bit overprotective? If he says he's fine, then he must be fine, Flora said, sounding irritated as she rushed through her words. It wasn't the tone of voice I knew from Flora, but it was unmistakably her. Had she been pretending all this time? As I was left speechless, Flora seemed to regain some composure and continued. I'm sorry, I'm just worried and getting irritated too. Flora tried to cover it up, but my weariness towards her didn't fade. For the first time, I thought of Flora as a potential danger. If things continued this way, Dorian might be in danger. A bad feeling crossed my mind. But as long as Dorian himself didn't say anything, I couldn't interfere in matters involving Flora. Dorian was due to visit in a few days, and I thought I should ask him more firmly then. Could he be troubled by something other than work? Perhaps there were serious issues in his marital life. Maybe, as Flora suggested, I was being a bit overprotective, but it should be okay to talk when he visited, to listen. I managed to hide my restless feelings and waited for the day Dorian would come. But my judgment was wrong. It's a decision I would regret for the rest of my life. Is this Mrs. James, mother of Dorian James? The sudden call from the police gripped my heart with pain. A dreadful premonition shot through me and I felt like I was about to faint. It couldn't be. Even before the officer could state their business, my mind was racing with the worst possible scenarios. Desperately trying to deny them, but feeling a sense of resignation too. I didn't want to hear any more. Fighting the urge to hang up, I nodded. As expected, it was the news of Dorian's death. Dorian had taken his own life. Please stay calm, I heard repeatedly. But I dropped the phone, forgetting even to cry. I stood there, dazed for a while. Why Dorian? Over and over again, like a broken person, I kept calling out Dorian's name. How much time had passed. The sound of the front door being pounded on snapped me back to reality. Worried about the broken call, Several police officers came to check on me. I crawled to the front door and opened it, seeing the officers standing there with pained expressions. I finally broke down and cried. A female officer accompanying them embraced me, crying together. 
Ah, uh, this was reality. Dorian was gone, and with that, I lost my beloved son. Overwhelmed with grief, I barely remember anything about the funeral. I even forgot my anger towards Flora, focusing only on what needed to be done. There was so much I wanted to say, to talk about, but at that time, I couldn't. The police, seeing my state, decided to postpone their questioning. They planned to talk to Flora in the meantime, but I doubted she would reveal anything. My intuition told me that Flora was the reason Dorian was driven to despair. Why didn't I contact Dorian right away? Why didn't I go to him immediately? My heart was flooded with regrets, and for a while I couldn't even speak. During this time, I received a letter. My hands trembled as I saw the sender's name. It was Dorian's. The handwriting was unmistakably his. Dorian should have passed away 13 days ago. Panicking, I hurried back to my room and opened the envelope. Tears flowed naturally as I embraced the letter from Dorian. It must have been a letter he wrote to me before his passing. With no suicide note and the real cause shrouded in darkness, I was scared to see its contents. Yet this letter might reveal what happened to Dorian, the cause that had been eating away at him for years. As I cautiously opened the letter, it was filled with words of gratitude towards me. My body started shaking uncontrollably, and I couldn't stop sobbing. Why couldn't I have saved him? Why, oh why? The same questions kept repeating in my head as I tried to put the letter back into the envelope with trembling hands. I noticed another piece of paper inside. What's this? When the folded paper was unfolded, it revealed unbelievable words written on it. Take revenge on my wife for me, it read, followed by an unfamiliar address. Is this where Dorian wants me to go? The tears had stopped, but cold sweat broke out. I couldn't imagine Dorian ever using the word revenge. He must have been pushed to the edge. What could I possibly find out there? I had been cooped up at home since the funeral, but I immediately rushed out. I was so absorbed that I even forgot to put on makeup. But now that didn't matter. I wanted to honor my dear son's last wish. With that sole purpose, I hurried to the address written in the letter. The place Dorian specified in his letter was a rental storage facility a short distance from my home. Among the rows of storage units, I found the one numbered in the letter. I inserted a thin, small key that was attached to the letter into the lock and opened the door. The small room, about the size of a half bedroom, was dimly lit and slightly musty despite it being daytime. When I pressed the switch next to the door, the exposed fluorescent light buzzed to life, illuminating the room. What is this? Inside the room was slowly becoming brighter, revealing a desk with several photos placed haphazardly on it. Surrounding it were scattered pieces of notepaper, and the floor was littered with notebooks and empty plastic bottles. The scene was bizarre, and I couldn't believe that Dorian had used this place. Dorian, always meticulous about his personal space and belongings, couldn't have been responsible for this disarray. My body instinctively felt fear, trembling all over. I was about to see something I shouldn't. The scene before me was a clear warning. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. Reluctantly, I focused on the photos on the desk, where I saw Flora, but she wasn't alone. Flora was holding hands intimately with an unknown man. As I looked at the other photos, each one captured the two of them. These photos undoubtedly served as proof of infidelity. Though I had suspected it from the letter, Flora was the cause of Dorian's stress. While there might have been some stress from work, it was undoubtedly Flora's fault that Dorian took his life. Trembling, I frantically began to go through the notes and notebooks. The notebook was filled with small writing, detailing the exact date and time when Flora said specific things to Dorian. It meticulously recorded the things Flora had done to him. She called him useless. She hit him. The horrific nature of these accounts made my heart scream. Why didn't I notice? Why didn't Dorian say anything to me? The more I thought, the more guilt filled my mind. In addition to Dorian's handwritten notes, there were also reports that he must have commissioned from someone else. The photos seemed to be the result of a private investigation into Flora's infidelity. I also found several USB drives in an envelope on the desk. I packed them into my bag and closed the storage unit door. Staying any longer felt like it would drive me insane. The place was swirling with Dorian's resentment. Even I, as his mother, was mercilessly assaulted by it. I'm sorry, Dorian, I whispered, filled with hatred for Flora, who had changed my son so drastically. I resolved to seek revenge. 
Why did Dorian have to endure this? Why didn't he seek help from anyone? I vowed to find answers and avenge Dorian's unresolved grievances. Back home, I delved into the cruel treatment and evidence of Flora's infidelity that Dorian had left behind. Several times, I was overwhelmed by panic and nausea. It was an excruciatingly painful and self-destructive task. Waves of regret for not being able to do anything overwhelmed me, and I couldn't stop my tears. Even if I fulfilled my revenge, Dorian wouldn't come back. But I couldn't just stand still. I forced myself to think about what to do with the evidence. Dorian had left the police would soon come to inquire. Should I hand these over? No, that seemed too lenient. Dorian ended his life hating Flora and her affair partner. What should I do to ensure Dorian rests in peace? Just then, the doorbell rang, indicating a visitor. Could it be the police visiting? When I checked the intercom camera, a familiar face appeared. Hello, it's Asher here. The young man bowing to the camera was Nolan Asher, a friend of Dorian since high school. When I opened the door, Asher, dressed in a suit, bowed again with a solemn expression. I invited him in, and he asked to pay respects at Dorian's altar. So I led him to the prayer room. Asher took some offerings out of his bag and sat in front of the altar. After praying fervently for a while, he turned back to face me. His expression had changed from before. It looked like he had made some kind of decision. Asher adjusted the glasses on his left hand, then reached into his pocket and took something out. It was a letter. Asher, maintaining his posture, placed the letter he had taken out on the floor and extended it toward me. It was the same letter I had received from Dorian. This is a letter from Dorian. I understand you've received one as well, he said. Dorian had sent a letter asking for revenge against Flora, not only to me, his mother, but also to Asher as his mother. It's one thing for me to be involved, but I can't drag Asher, an outsider, into this. It pained me to deny Dorian's wish, but I expressed this to Asher. However, Asher rejected that idea. Even if it's about revenge, I have no intention of doing anything illegal. I'm sure Dorian wouldn't have wanted that, he said directly to me, making me realize something right. What was I thinking? Shocked by Dorian's loss, I was swayed by the word revenge. I had no clear plan, and being alone, I might have done something drastic. Did Dorian consider this and also leave a letter for Asher? I gave you one at the funeral, but here it is again, Asher said, pulling out a business card case from his pocket. The card he handed me bore Asher's name and his professional details. At that time, I couldn't discuss things in detail and could only hand you my card somewhat abruptly. Now that I think about it, I do remember Asher giving me his card at the funeral. He had visited our house several times during high school and even attended the wedding. I remember thinking it odd to receive a business card then, but I was too shocked to check it back then. I hadn't paid attention to Asher's words at that time. Asher had indeed said, If you have any trouble, please contact me. The business card he handed me read, Asher Law Office. That's right. After graduating high school, Asher pursued a career in law. I knew he had been coming to our house, but all I knew was that he was working in New York. I never imagined he had become a lawyer. Asher had received Dorian's letter and decided to seek revenge within the confines of the law. Having lost a dear friend, he came to my house with that determination. I've closed my office for a while, he said, smiling for the first time. It was a familiar smile. Asher, as a friend, wanted to help Dorian and me, insisting on not taking any money. Along with the letter, Dorian had sent a substantial amount of money as a retainer fee via registered cash mail, but Asher handed it all back to me. I can't accept this. Please let me do this as a friend, as the least I can do since I couldn't help him, he said, bowing again. I hastily stopped him and decided to keep the money temporarily. Not just me, Asher was also suffering from not being able to save Dorian. I should consider Asher's feelings as well. I told Asher about the contents of Dorian's letter and what I found in the storage unit. But let's take a break first. You must be tired from your journey. How about some tea? Despite our shared urgency, it felt reassuring to have a strong ally in Asher. The same must be true for Asher. We both needed to calm down. I welcomed Asher as my son's friend. When Asher saw the documents I handed him, he let out a deep sigh. This is tough, he said. Words that could be for me or perhaps just slipped out unintentionally. 
The man Flora was having an affair with was named Owen Jones, according to the notes Dorian left. Jones knew Dorian as well. He had repeatedly threatened Dorian to leave Flora and continued to harass him. Asher, knowledgeable in law, said that Jones was as guilty as Flora. Even if they don't admit to the affair, there are photos and evidence left by Dorian. With this, we should have enough to fight back. As a lawyer, I can't do anything in court, but I know. While it would mean bringing charges against the two people who drove Dorian to his end, doing so would render my role as a lawyer unnecessary. This is because I have no intention of defending either of them. The end goal would be to organize Dorian's evidence, submit it to the police, and then press for substantial damages against the two. We will submit what Dorian left to the police and bring the two to justice, Asher said, almost as if to reassure himself. He needed to maintain his composure. I explained to Asher that I was scheduled to speak with the police soon. With all this evidence, Flora and Jones would face some punishment, regardless of what they said. However, I desperately wanted to speak directly with Flora. As a mother, I felt obligated to face her. I told Asher that I wanted to speak with Flora without revealing the existence of Dorian's evidence. Asher readily agreed, saying, of course. Once Asher compiled the evidence and submitted it to the police, there might not be another chance to talk to Flora. There was no telling when the police might come to me. Time was running short. I decided to go to Flora's place right away without any prior notice. Flora showed confusion upon my unexpected visit. It seemed she thought I wouldn't recover from the shock of the funeral. She must have felt awkward because she had previously shown her true nature over the phone. She seemed internally anxious about what I might say. I know everything from Dorian. He's not coming back, but apologize right now. Apologize to Dorian. I couldn't hold back anymore. Upon seeing Flora living her life as if nothing had happened, I naturally started speaking. What are you talking about? Why should I apologize? What have I done? Flora's face froze in shock upon hearing my words, becoming frantic. Seeing her reaction, I realized that Flora had been uneasy these past few weeks. She had been worried all along about when her crimes would be exposed. That's why she reacted so sensitively to my words. Although she might deceive the police who don't know the truth, she couldn't fool me. I know everything from Dorian. Your affair with a man named Jones. All the terrible things you've done to Dorian. It's all your fault. You took Dorian from us. I chose my words deliberately and threw them at Flora. As expected, she became even more agitated. I don't know, I don't know, I haven't done anything. Flora covered her ears and shook her head in denial. Her psyche was already broken and my visit completely shattered it. She collapsed, repeating while crying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I regretted not realizing it sooner. If I had been stronger, perhaps Flora would have changed her behavior towards Dorian. It's frustrating to think that such a person continued to torment Dorian. I contacted Asher and explained what had happened. Asher chose to explain everything to the police right there. He seemed surprised that the resolution came so quickly, not expecting Flora to admit her guilt. I thought Flora would resist more and never admit her guilt, but the outcome was anticlimactic. Later, I learned that Flora never imagined Dorian would take his own life. Flora thought by harassing him, Dorian would initiate the divorce without any proof of her affair. She wouldn't have to pay alimony and had no intention of admitting to the affair. She planned to claim that Jones was just a friend. It was a crazy plan, but both of them thought it would work. Dorian didn't consult anyone and didn't file a lawsuit based on the evidence he collected because he still loved Flora. He hoped she would repent and cut ties with Jones, but he must have realized his wish would never come true. Dorian could have taken revenge himself, but he was too distraught to make a rational decision. He couldn't bring himself to sue Flora. Unaware of Dorian's kindness, Flora continued to push him to the edge. After Asher contacted the police, Flora and Jones were taken in for questioning. Jones was quickly found and the evidence left by Dorian exposed their crimes. Since then, Flora has become unable to speak properly. Even after receiving a guilty verdict along with Jones, Flora remains confined in a police hospital. The story became national news, with the crimes of Jones and Flora rapidly spreading across the country. Dorian's death was acknowledged as a result of their actions. Asher's efforts played a significant role, and he perfectly handled the claim for damages. As expected, Jones lost his job. His sins became known to his company and friends, leaving him without a single acquaintance. 
Even if he re-enters society, he will have to continue paying damages and remain the subject of rumors. That's the severity of the crimes they committed. Flora, meanwhile, remains in her unchanged state, with no prospect of recovery, according to the doctors. Ever since, she has been repeating apologies, unable to sleep without medication. The two were exposed and punished, according to the law. However, Dorian won't return. Did we manage to fulfill his last wish? After witnessing their conviction, Asher decided to return to New York. Thank you for everything. I don't know if this has brought any solace, but I hope we did something for Dorian, he said with a somber expression as I saw him off. Dorian was lucky to have a friend like you, Asher. Thank you so much, I said, overwhelmed with heartfelt gratitude. Asher, slightly flustered, responded, I just did what I could as a friend. Please don't be so formal. With a smile, he started walking away. Without him, I might have lost my composure. Who knows what could have happened? I secretly struggled to keep my anger at bay and remain calm, deeply appreciative of Asher's efforts in judiciously handling the situation. Although he was no longer there to see it, I continued to bow my head in gratitude afterward. Asher established a volunteer organization to assist people burdened with various troubles. This allowed even those with financial difficulties to access legal remedies. Perhaps his inability to save Dorian fueled this endeavor. Asher continues this work alongside his job, aiding many people. Just a few weeks ago, Asher came to visit Dorian's tomb. During his recent visit, Asher introduced me to his wife and their newborn child. No matter how busy he is, he always makes sure to visit a few times a year. Dorian would surely be delighted by this. As for myself, I quit the part-time job I had been working since Dorian's passing. I felt there was something unique only I could do, without the knowledge or power of someone like Asher. I still believed there was something I could contribute. That's when I decided to volunteer for a group that supports families who have lost their loved ones. I joined an organization founded by a doctor who practices internal medicine nearby. We work together to face various people and their problems. I was saved by Asher and managed to recover from my grief. I wanted to help others who have sunk into despair like I did after losing Dorian. With that intention, I started this activity. Gradually, I realized that this is where I belong. Not only does this work save grieving families, but it might also help prevent tragedies like Dorian's. My involvement with this work led to a close relationship with the doctor who started the organization. I hadn't planned for this, and at times, I feel guilty towards my late husband and Dorian. However, I've come to think that perhaps it's all right for me to find happiness, too. I've realized that it's okay for me to think this way, and thus, I've gradually started a new relationship. Even if I fall in love again, I will never forget my husband and Dorian. I intend to live carrying their memories with me. So it's all right for me to be happy, isn't it? Let's conclude the story shortly. The pain of losing Dorian never fully fades, but I find solace in the work I do, helping others navigate their grief. The doctor who runs the organization and I have built a strong bond, and while it feels strange to think of happiness again, I have started a new relationship. It doesn't diminish the love I have for my husband and Dorian, but it allows me to move forward, carrying their memories with me. I know Dorian would want me to be happy, to find peace, and in helping others find theirs, I find a sense of purpose, a way to honor his memory. The journey was long and arduous, filled with pain and anger, but ultimately it led me to a place of healing and acceptance. And that, I believe, is what Dorian would have wanted. Mm -hmm.